Taylor Riggs in New York in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, tech strong. U.S. tech jobs stand out in an otherwise rather disappointing August jobs report. We'll explore where the jobs are and what skills are in demand. Plus, vape warning. The CDC says sudden serious lung illnesses have struck some people who use vaping devices that contain THC. We'll have the details. And secret pact. Several car companies band together with California to cut carbon emissions, even as there are federal efforts to ease restrictions on car makers. President Trump calls the action illegal, and now the Justice Department is investigating. But first, to our top story. As the trade war escalates, the job market decelerates, or so Friday's U.S. jobs report indicates. Total non-farm payrolls for August came in at 130,000. That's about 30,000 below what was expected. But despite those numbers, President Trump's top economic advisor told Bloomberg he believes in the strength of the U.S. tech sector. We are the world's leader in technology, invention, innovation, application, and new business starts. We are the world's leader. Technology, tech, technology is our family jewels, and we must protect America on that. That's the president's point of view. Joining me to discuss, Michael Solomon, co-founder of 10X Ascend, a talent agency for tech professionals. So, Michael, you heard it there. Tech is the crown jewel. Do you agree? I do. Tech is a fast-growing sector. It's going to keep growing. We are in great shape on building technology. I don't know if we're the, the exclusive world leader on that. There's a lot of countries that are in that race, but we're doing really well. Aside from some of the jobs report, which I want to get into, a lot of the conversation, as you know, has all been about trade. Do you see trade starting to impact hiring within the tech sector? Not directly, but I think that what we're seeing is trade and the trade war influencing the overall economy, and we're hearing talk of hiring freezes, we're hearing talk of layoffs, we're starting to see that, and what we're seeing in the tech sector is companies are trying to hire much more quickly than they were before, I think for fear that somebody's gonna say, mm -hmm. so somebody's gonna pump the brakes. So the last CTO we helped negotiate a job, they moved very quickly and were very willing to give us what we were looking for for that person. Um, and we're also starting to see on the on the freelance side an increase in demand because the, the, the hiring is slowing. That's interesting because I've heard a lot about consumer, or I should say business hesitation and some worries about hiring because they're not quite sure how the trade fight will work out. So you're seeing the opposite. You're seeing companies speed up hiring to get ahead of it? Yes. Uh, they they want to get the people in, in these, in these key roles before somebody at the top says, hiring freeze. Very interesting. Okay, so talk to me about today's jobs number. As we know, the headline number, not so good. Digging down within the tech sector, how did we do? I think the tech sector is going strong and is going to keep going strong. We're going to see changes that are coming to the rest of the economy as a result of the tech sector. We in, in the tech sector are creating so much efficiency and building so, such great products and technology and software that we're eating a lot of other jobs. And we're just at the beginning of seeing what the, what's going to happen. But as this as this downturn comes, and it will, um, we're going to see a lot of jobs that go away that are never going to come back. I want to come into my terminal here at GTV Go. From the market's perspective, software has outperformed hardware as we think that software is less vulnerable to the trade war. Correct. Are you seeing that play out within the job market? Not directly, but I think we're, we're, we're at the tip of that iceberg because as companies are having to really rethink their manufacturing chains, they're, they're having to rethink everything around technology everything around hardware, everything around software, and where they're manufacturing and how, how much it costs. I mean, we're seeing a lot of companies start to prepare consumers that you're going to be eating some of the costs from this trade war. It was very interesting within the jobs data, we noted that more people are working more jobs, two or three jobs, frankly, because one job doesn't cut it anymore. How does that fit into your gig economy? 
that was a really notable part of the report. The the section of people who are who are dissatisfied or not able to make enough money and moving out of full time jobs because they can't get them into into the gig economy is growing. We're going to see that that's been happening for years. That's going to keep happening for a while. I believe the public thought that the gig economy was a, was an action of choice. And I think for the people we represent at the very highest levels of technology creators, it is a choice. But for many people who are doing two and three jobs, it's because they can't get a job. And that's where the, the, the jobs numbers that have been coming out are a little bit, bit misleading. They're both misleading because they don't really factor in people who have really fallen out of the, the unemployment numbers, but they're also misleading because they're not counting these people who end up in this, in this category. Mm -hmm. A decade ago, San Francisco was the only place to do tech, or San Jose, right, Silicon Valley. More and more, it's spreading out geographically. D.C., New York are within the top five of places where tech jobs are being listed and created. Is tech spreading to the East Coast as well and Texas, for example? Everywhere. And any company that thinks they're not a tech company isn't going to be around in a long time like for, for a long time. It's like this is, this is how you have to be thinking. You have to create efficiencies. There's so much opportunity between automation mm -hmm. and AI that if you're not thinking about this stuff, and the societal implications are massive and scary, um, but from the standpoint of being a business owner, or running a company for shareholders, you have to be looking at this. I mean, McDonald's bought 3,000 kiosks to replace cashiers. That's the beginning. You, we've all heard about the driverless car revolution that's coming. We're going to see it across so many sectors. Well, and we're talking later this hour about Goldman Sachs trying to hire some coders as well. So great analysis. That was Michael Solomon of 10X Ascend. Thank you for joining me. Now in Japan, Rakuten has pushed back the launch of its mobile phone service originally set for next month. That sent shares of the e-commerce company's giant down by the most since May. Rakuten says a limited trial will begin October 1st and the full scale rollout will happen between a month after that and the end of the year. Coming up, Huawei tries to circumvent U.S. trade sanctions by exploring Gmail alternatives and updating its flagship phone, the P30 Pro. More on that, as well as expectations ahead for next month's U.S.-China trade talks. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen to us on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. To the companies affected by U.S.-China trade tensions, Huawei said Friday it plans to unveil an updated phone running Google's latest software in some regions. It would be Huawei's first major update to its flagship P30 Pro phone since the imposition of U.S. export restrictions, which forced the company to slash revenue projections by about $10 billion. At the same time, Huawei seems to be making efforts to come up with an encrypted email service on future mobile devices getting away from Google's Gmail. With details, Bloomberg Technologies, Alistair Barr from San Francisco. Alistair, the key for me was that this was an updated software, not a new one. Is this how they avoid sanctions? This is one way to do it. So they, they've already had a, this phone out and they're going to do they're basically doing a major update to it. And the, the rules um, that the U.S. has imposed on suppliers to Huawei, they, they all revolve around new products. So if, if Huawei actually brings out a brand new phone, Google will actually have trouble providing Huawei with the Android operating system and all the Google apps like Gmail and Google Maps that go with that. Um, so that's, that's really the, the small loophole that Huawei is jumping through right now. The problem will come when they actually want to do a brand new phone, which may come a little bit later this year. That one is likely to be shipping without, without Android, the official Google Android and all the official Google apps. Well, that was my one of my key questions is you have customers that might be OK for now with an updated software. How long until they become frustrated enough that they don't have the new software that they start to switch away from Huawei? 
I think that's a, that's a big risk for sure. And uh, we were looking at one note today from Gene Munster, who's a, a veteran Apple watcher. And he was saying that, that actually f this might be good news for Apple in Europe. Really, um, it, it will it'll probably leave two premium handset providers in, in Europe at the high end, Apple and Samsung, because Huawei is, is really going to struggle with new phones if they, if they don't come with the, with the official Google Android system when they ship. Alistair, what is Huawei's long-term game plan? I mean, you think when Android comes out and Apple comes out with that new phone, what does Huawei do? What's their long-term solution? Well, the long-term solution is to, to build an operating system of their own, which they are working on, so they don't need Android. The problem comes when you're outside of China. People expect an Android phone to have Gmail, Google Maps, um, the Google Play Store, really, which is the important one, where you can get all the other apps through the Play Store. So Huawei is going to have to build an app store itself, build an operating system itself. And, and the news that, that came earlier today about ProtonMail, which is this other email service, that's one of those examples where Huawei is going to have to go out and provide an alternative to Gmail and then go and provide an alternative to Google Maps and all these, all these other Google services. And quickly here, Alistair, is that ProtonMail enough to satisfy Huawei and customers in the short term? Uh, what Proton Mail is, is a very specific service for people who are really concerned about security, and it does actually char charge a monthly fee right now, so that might be a bit of a stretch for a lot of people. Thank you. That was Bloomberg Technologies' Alistair Barr. Now, the Huawei U.S. blacklist may not be on the table during the next round of U.S.-China talks in October. That's according to statements made by President Trump on Wednesday, in which he said Huawei is a, quote, national security concern. The comments came a day after Huawei lashed out at the U.S., accusing Washington of orchestrating a campaign to intimidate its employees and launch cyber attacks. Let's get inside on the trade talks next month from Craig Allen in Washington. He he is president of the U.S.-China Business Council. Craig, it seemed at least for this week, trade tensions sort of simmered down. Would you agree? Well, yes, I would agree, but it's on very little information. The only thing that we really know is that there will be a vice minister meeting sometime in September, followed by, if that is successful, a vice premier uh, and secretary meeting uh, or cabinet level meeting in October. Uh, but none of that is certain. So the information that we are working on is indeed very sparse. Any idea specific details that we want? Is it IP theft? Is it that Huawei's a national security concern? Is it soybeans? What is trade really coming down to? Well, I think uh, when you go back to the cause belly or the original source of the problem, there are probably six items that were very important. Intellectual property rights, forced technology transfer, state-owned enterprises, subsidies, market access, and cybersecurity or, or hacking. And all of those are important issues. And I think a lot of progress has been made on all of them. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can get to a solution, to an agreement. Uh, but the fact that we're going into our 13th round of negotiations is a very good sign. Will 13 be the lucky round? Uh, that remains to be seen. You know, we spoke with Larry Kudlow this morning, uh, the Trump administration's chief economic advisor. I want you to listen in to what he had to say about the next round of where we are in trade. There are no conditions. We're co they're coming to talk, and we welcome them with open arms. Our team would like to go back and pick up where we left off in the May uh, talks. Whether that will be possible yep. uh, remains to be seen. I, I don't want to predict it. All I know is... Uh, we got a new round of talks, and I think that's a very hopeful uh, development. Craig, your reaction? So this is number 13, and the fact that the two sides are meeting is a very good thing. Uh, at the same time, I wouldn't want to exaggerate uh, any shift on either side. And indeed, uh, we have quite a few new sanctions in place. We have tariffs going up on October 1. We have another very large round of tariffs going up 
on December 15th. Uh, so does that help negotiations or hurt negotiations? Are we closer to a deal or further away from deal? Uh, and I think time will tell. I appreciate uh, Larry Kudlow's optimism, and he knows a lot more than I do, and I uh, hope that uh, he's right, and we have to wish the negotiators well. Talk to me about those next round of tariffs. On September 1st, as you mentioned, within the technology sector, you had AirPods, a lot of hardware devices that really hit the consumer come into effect. December 15th, as we know, retail, holiday, shopping season. What are you looking for in those December 15 tariffs that could really hurt the consumer? Uh, so on December 15th, uh, there will be $170 billion worth of imports, which will be subject to 15% tariff. Now, that's a lot. Uh, it's a lot of imports and it's a lot of tariff. And it will absolutely have an effect at the till, uh, at, at the cash register. Uh, this will be inflationary. Now, that's on top of, as you just uh, said, uh, September 1 uh, tariffs and another round uh, of tariffs coming on October 1. And so this will have an impact on CPI. Uh, it will have an impact uh, particularly uh, on lower income Americans. Uh, a tariff is only a tax, and it just happens to be a very regressive tax uh, that affects low-income Americans uh, more than others. And uh, we're about to begin the fe to feel the impact of that, I regret to say. You talk about how the devil's in the details, and I think both sides want a deal, but the problem is getting there and meeting in the middle. Huawei, for example, I know you can't speak specifically to it, frankly, though, is a non-starter from the Chinese side and from the U.S. side, it being a national security concern. Where do we stand generally as it relates to national security and trade, lumping them together, and then you get Huawei? Well, that's a very complicated question. Now, Huawei is a perfect symbol of the complexity that we face here. Um, and the uh, arrest of uh, the CFO, Meng Wanzhou, uh, in uh, Vancouver, uh, wait, awaiting extradition to the United States, again, is a, is a point of real tension. So, but listen, the president has said uh, that he is willing to consider this as part of the trade deal. He suggested otherwise as well. But having said that, uh, we have uh, mixed national security and trade policy. Not a good thing to do, but it's already been done. Uh, and uh, so from a Chinese perspective, I understand their negotiating position is that they want to settle this deal as well. That adds complexity, uh, but it doesn't make it impossible. Certainly a plea bargain, some sort of an arrangement can be made by which Huawei admits to breaking U.S. law without necessarily admitting that they broke Chinese law. Uh, such a deal is possible, and I'm sure such a deal is being considered. Like you said, very complicated clumping the two together. My thank you to Craig Allen of the U.S.-China Business Council. Coming up, health concerns continue to stir around THC vaping, but what does that mean for the e-cigarette companies? We discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Marijuana vaping products have become increasingly popular in recent years as a discreet way to take a quick puff of pot. But suddenly, serious lung illnesses that have struck people who use vaping devices tied to many cases that products that contain THC. Many researchers have come out with new information on vaping in the last few days, but health questions still remain when using e-cigarettes. To discuss, we're joined by Bloomberg's Craig Giamona. So Craig, You've been covering this. I'm relatively new. Break this down for me. E-cigs, vaping, same or different? Basically the same. I mean, in common parlance, when somebody says vaping, they're often talking about marijuana. But, you know, Juul is a type of a vape as well. E-cigarettes, also a type of a vape. But e-cigarettes would refer to sort of tobacco products that people are using often to quit smoking or to cut back on smoking traditional cigarettes. But, you know, to me, vaping and e-cigs kind of like Kleenex and tissues. Mm. The same things, different way of saying the same thing. So to be clear, the CDC was talking about mostly THC-related illnesses. That's right. That's different. That's 
from the black market sometimes, so per se. Th the news today is, so there's been hundreds of illnesses across the country, a lot in the Midwest. There's been three yeah. deaths now. Nobody really knows what's going on other than that these people are vaping. What the CDC is saying today is that most of these people are reporting that they're vaping THC products, and these people are in states where marijuana is not legal, which means they're acquiring black market THC products. So that's where the sort of the concern is heightened now about, you know, people that vapes have become very, very popular in the U.S. over the last couple of years. They're available in the legal marijuana markets, but also widely available on the black market, including in New York, other places. So that's kind of the concern now is that these people appear to be getting sick from vaping black market THC. Okay. So the price action today was very interesting. When we got that headline, you'd shares of Altria and Philip Morris rise. What does this mean for companies in which they have stakes in? Icos and Juul, for example. Yeah, really interesting because, so Juul has been under fire here, right? Because of the concerns about a lot of teens jeweling and how popular it's gotten. So the reason why Altria owns about 35% of Juul, they paid $12.8 billion for that stake. The reason why Altria goes up on that news is because people are saying, oh, it looks like they're worried about THC, not about Juul. So sort mm. of good news for Juul that the scrutiny now is going to land on black market THC as opposed to teens who are, you know, vaping from a jewel. Philip Morris, on the other hand, they go up because they've spent billions of dollars developing ICOs, mm -hmm. which is quote unquote heat, not burn technology. That's a different way of smoking. You take like a cigarette, looks like a cigarette, put it into a device, inhale it, and it's just less harmful, or they argue less harmful than cigarettes. They've only recently got approved to sell that in the U.S. They have high hopes for it. They think they're going to go head on at Juul and other vaping products with the ICOs in the U.S. sooner rather than later. Come into my terminal here at GTV Go because what I'm taking a look at is segment revenue. This is revenue for Altria of smokeless products. Growing, growing, growing. Now the highest has been in multiple quarters. I wonder though how this sort of impacts Altria's deal with Philip Morris. Can we still assume a deal is on the table? Yeah, it's interesting. One of the rationales for putting those companies back together has a lot to do with the U.S., both Juul and Icos. So Philip Morris spent, like I said, billions of dollars developing Icos. Altria holds the license to market it in the U.S. Mm. So Philip Morris is saying, wow, now we're ready to go at the U.S., this massive market. Maybe we don't want to share the profits. If we buy Altria, put those companies back together, we can reap all the benefits from Icos in the U.S. Plus, oh, by the way, Altria has a stake in Juul, which, look, Juul's under some scrutiny, but long term, the argument is is that Juul is still going to be a good option to get smokers off of cigarettes. We've got to take care of this teenage problem, but that, right. you know, there's still a future for Juul. So that is part of the rationale for what would be a blockbuster tobacco deal. Complicated story, and you broke it down for me pretty well. Thank you so much. Yes. That was Bloomberg's Craig Giamona. And coming up, Facebook caught more antitrust fire this time from the states. We'll give you the details on the latest investigation next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in New York and for Emily Chang. Another day, another investigation. Facebook now joins Google in the crosshairs of a multi-state antitrust probe, adding to the scrutiny of Silicon Valley tech giants. New York Attorney General Latia James is leading a bipartisan coalition of states probing whether Facebook, quote, stifled competition and put its users at risk. Joining me to discuss from D.C. is Bloomberg's Ben Brody. Ben, you are right on time. I want to say we just sort of got another headline from Google saying that they are confirming basically what we knew, that the U.S. is requesting information on previous antitrust probes. And then, of course, Ben, as you know, this week, the more recent news is Facebook now in the crosshairs as well. Walk me through this. Is this a monopoly issue or a privacy data issue? 
Uh, so it sounds like on the Google side, this is uh, particularly a monopoly issue. They did disclose that the Department of Justice uh, has issued essentially a subpoena, a civil investigative demand for all previous documents uh, provided to enforcers anywhere in the world in any anti uh, in any antitrust or competition probe. So that is going to be uh, a lot of paperwork for the DOJ to go through, and it gives them uh, a lot of opportunity to go through a lot of theories of harm. When you look at Facebook on the other side, the New York lead probe, uh, that looks like it's going to be a little bit of privacy and a little bit of antitrust. Uh, so they're talking about data security. They're talking about ads, which of course straddles both borders, you know, how our data uh, is used uh, to advertise for us, as well as how they might have treated uh, upstart companies uh, and some other issues. It sounds like it's kind of early days here, but there, uh, there is a lot of probing that has been announced just in the last 24 hours. Well, like you said, a lot of probing, including that record $5 billion FTC fine that Facebook discussed and, and was open about just a few months ago. Is this different because the FTC is federal and these are state attorney probes? Uh, yeah, it's important to understand that the states mean that there are more lawyers in the room. There mm. are more courts, uh, you know, who can take action on these things. There are more laws that people are dealing with, more people who can review paperwork, more theories uh, that can be tried. And when it comes to settle, more people who can say, hey, that's not good enough. You have to go farther. Uh, this is a lot of distraction for those companies. Uh, and so the state federal issue is not necessarily uh, quite what it is. In a, in a lot of ways, they're dealing with the same sets of laws. They're enforcing the same laws, things like the FTC Act or the Clayton Act, the Sherman Act, issues like that. Uh, but it is, in general, a, a, just a lot of lawyers in the room. And that means that these companies become more cautious, less dynamic. And, it, you know, it just takes time and money to deal with these things. More lawyer fees, to be sure. So you are Absolutely. correct on that one. Ben, walk me through the case from Monopoly. You and I have had discussions multiple days about a monopoly has to arguably hurt a consumer. How is the consumer being hurt in these cases? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that the companies have been saying a lot. Hey. Consumers love us, mm -hmm. and our and our products are free. What's the problem here? And I think antitrust enforcers really just in the last year, and this is on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans have increasingly been saying, look, uh, consumer harm doesn't just have to be about price. You can hurt innovation. Uh, you can hurt product quality. There are a lot of measures of, uh, you know, basically competition in a market, whether it's robust. And we want to take a look at some of these. These aren't necessarily new measures. These are kind of old measures that passed away uh, uh, you know, under free market econo law and economics theories, uh, particularly under Republican administrations. And now both sides of the aisle are saying, hey, we want to bring these back. We think in these in these markets, what we call basically these zero price markets, these may be better measures of what's going on here and, and that it may be entirely possible that uh, the real price here should be negative. Ben, the key word that you just said is innovation. If you break up big tech, you cannot compete with China. Do they understand that? Uh, you know, that's a real thing that the companies are coming here in Washington and telling uh, enforcers. I think that that's something uh, that you can kind of tell Congress a little bit more easily than you can tell FTC and DOJ. Uh, ultimately, Congress has to weigh different policy prescriptions, whereas these enforcers, they have to enforce the law that they have, and they can't necessarily say, you know, we're concerned what, uh, you know, this sort of breakup would do to the market. They have to say, is there a legal violation here or not? And if they find one, you know, they have to pursue the remedy that they believe is the most appropriate. Developing story, Bloomberg's Ben Brody, thank you for joining me. And Thanks sticking much. with Facebook, the social media giant is coming for those Wall Street engineers. Facebook plans to double its headcount in New York City, aiming to hire more than 3,000 people over the next five years. The expansion could set Facebook up for a clash with some of the biggest firms in finance, including Goldman Sachs, which is looking to recruit more than 100 coders in the next few months. Joining me to discuss Bloomberg's Olivia Carville. Olivia, what I loved about this story is I've been on the these bank earnings calls and it is starting off with their investments in digital technology and we're going to be a tech company and Goldman's hiring coders. Now on the flip side of this, it felt like technology's now coming for Wall Street. Exactly, yeah. So we have Facebook saying that they want to double their headcount here in New York and they're specifically actually trying to recruit straight off Wall Street. During research for this story, I was looking at the LinkedIn profiles of various software engineers at Facebook and the companies they'd previously worked at are Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, JP Morgan, Citigroup, just time and time again.
Now, is it because they were at those big companies like a Goldman or a BlackRock, or is it because, frankly, New York is desperate for tech savvy people because they have jobs to fill and then frankly finance is one of the biggest jobs in New York City. Yeah I feel like a lot of the engineers who are coming out of our academic institutions like Columbia, NYU or Cornell Tech have traditionally gone into the finance sector so when Facebook's looking to recruit engineers it just mm -hmm. makes sense for them to look towards Wall Street but they're also now trying to target those institutions and recruit directly out of them and also at the same time like looking towards the finance sector to pull engineers from there as well. We spoke to one recruitment firm that said New York's kind of fight for talent right now is the fiercest she's ever seen it and it's bound to get worse because even though we have Facebook saying it's going to double its headcount over the next few years, we also know Google is trying to do the same and it wants to increase its workforce you know, from 8,000 to 14, 15,000 over the next decade. Amazon as well is active hiring here. Well, and as you know, with that fierce competition comes an increase in salary. How much money, let's say, for for I'll say JP Morgan now has to pay to compensate that coder who might now go to Facebook. Mm -hmm. Well, that was one of the most interesting <laughs> things I found looking into this is that the tech companies are actually paying more than finance and traditionally you wouldn't really have thought that. So at JP Morgan, a software engineer typically makes around $100,000 at the moment and at Facebook, that same engineer would make 150,000. So the talent's going to follow the money. I wonder generally what this means for the job market of New York City. There was a lot of backlash when Amazon had pulled out their second headquarters here and the amount of high paying quality jobs that they were expected to bring. This arguably is a very good thing. Healthy competition, more tech jobs in New York. Is that as well what you learned in your reporting? Yeah, I think this, if anything, is just going to boost New York's profile as a major tech hub. We know that the city is second only to the Bay Area when it comes to um, raising venture capital. And now we have these big tech giants look buying up real estate and looking to hire more and more people in the city. So it's just gonna get bigger. Uh, finally here, do you get the sense that banks are becoming more like tech companies or tech companies are becoming a little bit more like banks? I feel like banks are trying to become yeah. tech companies, um, if, if anything. And as you said earlier, Goldman Sachs is looking to hire 100 coders over the next uh -huh. few months. So I feel like times are changing. We all need to learn how to code. That was my <laughs> takeaway from this segment. That was Bloomberg's Olivia Carville. Thank you for joining me. And coming up, Facebook and Google aren't the only companies under investigation. We will break down the U.S. Justice Department's latest probe into automakers, Ford, BMW, VW, and Honda, next. The U.S. Justice Department has launched an antitrust investigation into four automakers who made a deal with California on tougher vehicle emission standards. Honda, Ford, BMW and Volkswagen agreed with California's clean air regulator to boost the fuel efficiency of autos sold in the U.S. through 2026. This is in defiance of a proposal by the Trump administration to ease back those national standards. Joining me to discuss is Bloomberg's Craig Trudell. So Craig, a very sort of complicated story to me on first look. It felt like the Trump administration's uh, issue, let's say, was more with California than the automakers. Walk me through this. Right. So we have to kind of take a step back and, and think back to the Obama administration where the automakers were actually sort of brought along with that administration on tougher fuel economy rules, but they were going to sort of gradually get there. Uh, you got to the point where toward the end of the administration, uh, the car makers got a little bit concerned about maybe these rules are going to be too tough. They wanted them softened a little bit. And they got that with the Trump administration. But what the Trump administration did was kind of go overboard. They, they really wanted to water things down. And California, which uh, for, for years, because of the pollution problems that they had, uh, especially in the cities back in the 70s, they've had an ability to set tougher rules. Right. And what the automakers didn't want was for the feds to set uh, you know, significantly weakened standards and California to keep theirs, it would result in, in sort of having to meet these wildly different rules uh, depending on where you're selling in the U.S. So like you said, 
a federal and a California fight leaves these automakers in a period of uncertainty, which arguably is the worst case scenario for them. We have some statements from these automakers doing their best to say that we're cooperating. We are here ready to talk to the U.S. Justice Department. What are the automakers saying? So what they wanted was uh, for the Trump administration to take a look at the rules, kind of, you know, do a little bit of nipping and tucking mm -hmm. here. Uh, but what they didn't want the administra administration to do was to go to war with California, which mm -hmm. they essentially have done. And so what you had was uh, Ford, Volkswagen, BMW and Honda go to California and say, hey, let's, you know, dial the standards back a little bit uh, in California, uh, but we'll agree to hit these uh, tougher standards that you're setting as long as you know there can be sort of a, a peacemaking deal here. And the Trump, Trump administration today took the most drastic measure yet to really say, oh, no, you don't, automakers. You're, you're sort of, you know, you need to come back into our camp sort of uh, deal. So they're caught in the middle here. One lawyer in that story asked if this really was an anti-competitive case or if it was more of a pro Com competition and pro, pro competitive case. What do you make of that? I, I think what the professor, the point the professor was trying to make, and what some others are are worried about is is just the idea that you know this is a situation where uh, the DOJ is sort of stepping in to mm -hmm. say if you cross the White House, uh, you know you're you're <laughs> you're going to hear from us. Um, I, I think with uh, the automakers, they they want to uh, compete on fuel economy because they know that they're going to have to in other parts of the world. And, you know, even the, the Fords of the world, while they sell a lot of uh, F-Series pickups and that's their bread and butter business, they understand and appreciate that they sort of have to get with the times. What about the case to be made of other car makers that maybe don't get as much special treatment, if you will, than those four that did that deal with California? So you what you have a, is a situation too where the automakers that didn't get in on that deal are really sort of nervous you had uh, a report recently that maybe mercedes-benz was mm. going to get in but you know they're caught in the middle of the trade war and nervous about crossing the white house same with general motors we just had mary barra visiting uh just yesterday so they're all of the automakers what they what they really want at the end of the day is certainty of of being able to plan for their products, you have to plan four or five years out for before a new model is brought to market. And it's really difficult to do that when you don't know the rules of, of the road. Yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you. That was Bloomberg's Craig Trudell. And still ahead, a quarterback's huddle. Signals aren't the only ones fans will be paying attention to in NFL stadiums this year. We look at how the league is boosting in-game Wi-Fi for fans. That's next. This is Bloomberg. On Thursday, WeWork significantly reduced the valuation it's seeking in its U.S. IPO. Originally hoping for a $47 billion valuation, sources are saying WeWork could now target closer to about $20 billion. Co-founder Adam Newman is feeling the heat, but one of the company's most powerful investors could be hit even harder. SoftBank and its affiliates own about 29% of WeWork, which means it is tied up in a big way. To discuss, I'm joined by Bloomberg Technologies' Sarah McBride. Ride. Sarah, I just have to ask, how does SoftBank respond to a valuation that is half of what they thought it was? Champagne corks. Just kidding. <laughs> I think, that, well, we our reporting showed that there is a lot of um, consternation about this inside SoftBank, particularly at the Vision Fund, which uh, was not nearly as enthusiastic about investing in WeWork as other parts of SoftBank, and there's a lot of tension now within the company over this investment. Sarah, within that tension was a meeting between SoftBank and Adam Newman of WeWork. Any indication of how that meeting went and the tension in the room? Well, earlier this year, we know that Adam Newman had told Masayoshi Son that by IPO, the valuation would be at least $47 billion. And now, as you said, it looks like the valuation is going to be closer to around $20 billion. So that's the same valuation roughly where the Vision Fund invested two years ago. But after that initial investment, which was over $4 billion, SoftBank, other parts of SoftBank came back and invested over six 
$1.8 billion more. So, uh, and most recently at a valuation of $47 billion. So those investments, if that $20 billion valuation is right are going to be very underwater. Sarah, we know the story that SoftBank is an investor as well in Uber, that IPO right. less than stellar. Any indication right. that this is also some hesitation given the IPO market right now? Well, um, I should say that SoftBank was a large investor in Uber. It was Uber's largest um, investor, but even then it was only 16%. Now we're talking about 29%. So um, that's a huge, huge stake. I'd say uh, almost unheard of. And so um, SoftBank is already dealing with Uber's IPO not going very well. It's trying to raise more money for its second vision fund. WeWork is a large investment in the original vision fund. And so SoftBank was hoping to be able to point to a big gain here. It looks like that's not going to happen. It's going to hurt it with its fundraising for the second vision fund and just be a little bit of a black mark on SoftBank overall. Sarah, quickly, you talked about fundraising for that second fund. There were reports that SoftBank was lending money to an employees at a 5% rate in which to invest. Any sign that that's also a lack of demand? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. A lack of demand given for that second round of fundraising for Vision 2? Oh, right. I mean, uh, yeah, I think this is really hurting it as it goes out and tries to tout previous successes for Vision 2. It's got a couple. I mean, um, they made money on Slack. Mm -hmm. uh, Garden Health is doing pretty well, but those are much smaller investments compared to its investment in in uh, WeWork. Great breakdown. That was Bloomberg Technology. Sarah McBride, thank you for joining me. Now, finally, the NFL season kicked off Thursday night with Green Bay Packers defeating the Chicago Bears, but not every eye in the stadium was glued to the action, partly thanks to the NFL re-upping its partnership with Extreme Networks. Thanks to the deal, Extreme will provide Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi analytics solutions for the next three football seasons and two Super Bowls. I spoke with the CEO, Ed Meyer Cord, about what data the NFL is downloading thanks to the deal. The NFL is all about fan experience. So we provide the infrastructure connecting devices to the applications running in the cloud. And it's all about the fan experience, the quality of connectivity. And then the data now is being used for new services, new solutions that stadiums are trying to roll out to enhance the fan experience. So for example, if you look at you know, in-seat concessions, um, if you look at interactive fan engagement on the large screen in the stadium, or if you look at gambling, if you're looking from an application level, the NFL is very interested in all the gambling that's going on inside their stadium. So you know, net net, there's a lot of different ways that the NFL can monetize the data as well as the clubs can use the data to enhance the fan experience. Well, one thing that you said that caught my eye was the bet perhaps on future legalized sports betting or sports gambling. How big of that is an issue with the partnership with the Wi-Fi? Well, it's important because they want to see what's going on in the stadium. So when fans are at the game, they want to understand what they're doing and what apps they're using. So it helps them in their discussions with the different gaming providers and gambling providers. Talk to me about data privacy. When I think about Wi-Fi, trying to avoid going on a Wi-Fi server or a Wi-Fi network, it's because when you know you go on Wi-Fi, there's the potential to get hacked. How are you protecting privacy? So we do that with software. And you're, you're spot on because security is obviously a huge issue. And in our industry, what is networking, what used to be very much of a hardware industry, today it's really about software. So stadiums and all of our customers in different enterprises, what they have to have is security at the edge of their network to protect users as well as to protect network and then systems that they're running on the network. How much of a threat is 5G? When 5G rolls out, it will be very, very fast, faster than Wi-Fi. Are you worried? No, 5G for us is, is complementary to Wi-Fi. 
So when we look at 5G deployments, what that means is that there's going to be a lot more bandwidth, uh, applications that are consuming more bandwidth, and then when they get down to the local level into the enterprise, they'll roam over to our Wi-Fi network. So for us, you know, we see it as an opportunity because the more bandwidth that's running across the network, it means you're going to need more capacity in the Wi-Fi network as well. You know, we started off this conversation talking about the fan experience within the stadium, and a lot of that comes down to virtual reality, AR, VR. How much of that as well is part of this deal? Well, so if, if for us, we're providing that connectivity, and then different applications will run over the network. Gaming, as you probably know, has been one of the fastest growing areas in sports. So eSports has taken off. So the gamification of different uh, you know, games in the NFL or uh, players or different simulations, these are things that are probably going to be part of the future of the fan experience. That was my conversation with Extreme Network CEO Ed Meyercord. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology and Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.